So thanks everyone for joining our session. We are going to talk about community dental health coordinators uh, bridging the gap in access. Uh, the opportunity here and what you're seeing on this opening slide is the community dental health coordinator, what we call um, the uh, icon or the, um, the, the symbol. Uh, it's not a logo per se, but it defines what the mission of CDHCs are, and that is connecting patients to an avenue of care. You've heard from multiple speakers today uh, that merely having a full ready workforce uh, doesn't necessarily connect those people to that care. So we're talking about connection, preventing disease, and educating, educating everyone, not just the patients, but the entire community as a whole. Now, in December of 2012, uh, the American Medical Association published a commentary about patients needing help with their social problems, connections to resources in the community, transportation, translation, and the increasingly complex language of medicine. We think that the medicine language is complex. We know that ours is complex. It's so complex, in fact, the physicians have trouble understanding it. And so the American Dental Association looked at uh, identifying social needs. The fact that the drivers of health outcome can influence care and health outcomes, even more than the care itself. And you've heard multiple speakers already talk about social economic factors, social determinants of care, if you will, health behaviors, physical environments. Identifying social needs is a critical piece of improving health outcomes. Now, from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, health educators and community health workers, the demand for these professionals is expected to grow faster than many other occupations. And the demand for this type of service is driven by uh, the improvement, the need to improve health outcomes and reduce healthcare costs. We just can't place money in a light item and say, well, we're going to be augmenting a budget on this particular topic and expect the health outcomes to naturally follow. So the American Dental Association looked at what a community health worker skill set does for a team, the case management piece of it, addressing social determinants. In the dental world, we typically don't function uh, with a sense of case management. We like to hand people a sheet of paper and say, here, call one of these numbers um, and just make an appointment. We expect patients to self-navigate, self-educate, self-facilitate, self-motivate. And in the medical world, that doesn't happen. Why would we expect the dental world, the complex dental world to be any different? So in January of 2020, the Center for Healthcare Strategies issued a special report on recognizing and sustaining the value of community health workers and promotoras. And so the American Dental Association a few years ago uh, looked at uh, the opportunity to do something similar in the dental world. Now, the conclusion of the report from 2020 was talking about cultural differences and the fact that there's a very formalized environment in a, a healthcare delivery setting, but there is a need to bridge that formalized environment with the more informal uh, community environment. And so the ADA asked years ago, what if a dental professional had those community health worker skills. And so community dental health coordinators are assistants or hygienists that are trained to be through an online modular program, a dental version of a community health worker. They could be the face of a dental practice in a community. They understand the dental world, but they also understand the community world. That is what the online program does. And they can, promote and deliver prevention strategies. We've heard speakers talking about uh, primary care and, and the vaccination process. And in primary care offices, such as pediatrician offices, it's very handy to have a CDHC, that's a hygienist or an assistant who is able and, and through their dental background, ready to apply topical fluoride varnish and do some risk assessment of these families and connect them to care directly. Why do dental people need to be navigators? You know, uh, the world still tends to think of dental professionals as only performing a procedure. And yet they have this additional valuable skill set 
the awareness, the understanding of what appointments are necessary and the amount of time that those appointments take. I will never forget presenting to an oncology office, a large oncology office, uh, who could not understand why uh, we wanna start radiation therapy. Um, we, we're gonna give the dental clinic uh, one to two weeks notice before we're gonna start radiation therapy. Go ahead and take all the teeth out uh, for somebody we haven't seen. They don't understand x-rays, health history. The fact that dental procedures uh, are the surgery du jour, uh, and it is surgery. Uh, as I used to remind my good friends in our uh, medical section of the FQHC I worked at for 12 years, we're not giving haircuts over here. Uh, so we do a health history, uh, and sometimes we need to talk to the physician. Um, so the, the, the modular online content of the CDHC program deals with community mapping, home visit strategies, how to be a change agent within your community. This gets at least for some of the time, and we've got examples where it is full-time, gets the hygienist or the dental assistant out into the community, uh, particularly when uh, the uh, patient flow in the operatories is less than optimal. And many of us work with FQHCs, very successful FQHCs, but sometimes uh, the broken appointment rate isn't uh, what we'd like it to be, isn't as low as what we'd like it to be. We know there's more to oral health than teeth. Uh, this young man had come to me from the pediatrician. Uh, the um, actually grandma had started there uh, and the pediatrician um, diagnosed a low grade fever and kind of some general malaise uh, and uh, said, well, we're gonna put them on antibiotic. Now, those of us from the dental world know that uh, these oral herpetic lesions uh, are not going to be cured by uh, an antibiotic. And had we had somebody in the pediatrician's office, that appointment uh, could, have been, uh, could have been made directly with us. So the CDHC points to remember, community dental health coordinator, whatever you want to call them, uh, our program is a standardized licensed curriculum. And by standardized, I mean that Anyone who goes through this program and receives a medallion on their certificate of completion can use that in all 50 states because there are no new clinical duties in this. This curriculum is pre-packaged. It is loaded into an educational venue. Zoo Fall, we're delighted to say, is the first FQHC that offers this program. Uh, through their spectacular online distance learning platform. There's no travel necessary, but the modules are available as students are able to take them. And there are supplemental Zoom sessions, uh, which are extremely valuable to help the students get to know each other because they do have a, a nationwide distance platform, but also for them to share ideas and network and learn about what's happening in their part of the country. There is a community demonstration project, which is part of the CDHC, what we call an internship. And that is for the trainee to show that they understand the cultural competency, motivational interviewing pieces of the curriculum. The motivational interviewing module is a few months long. It isn't leafing through uh, a few articles on a weekend. Uh, this program, we are delighted to say, is college level program. And the opportunity here to do a public project, I will share with you that uh, more than one of these public projects have turned into HRSA grants. And so the opportunity here for uh, trainees to earn a medallion on their certificate of completion, again, portability, portability to all 50 states. There are no clinical duties that are any different from a state practice act uh, from what that dental professional already possesses. So a little bit about the internship project, uh, the community-based, um, every graduate uh, writes a reflection paper. Uh, and these are seasoned dental professionals that write this. And at the beginning of the program, uh, they probably had some preconceived notion of how valuable this skill set would be, but then when they come out on the other side, um, the opportunity is for them to share even a deeper dive into that. Here's an example uh, of a community demonstration project, an internship that turned into a multi-year HRSA grant and resulted 
in an article published in the Journal of Dental Education. Uh, this uh, very savvy uh, CDHC was in Alabama. Uh, she connected uh, the Head Start, very young children under the age of six, and familiarized uh, the dental students at the University of Alabama, Birmingham, with the opportunity to feel comfortable and confident as clinicians in doing these well baby exams. This is so critical. This is the number one request of the American Academy of Pediatrics. We want more dentists to see young children. So that developed into a HRSA project. Uh, the article was published. Here is another example of a CDHC graduate who started her own nonprofit, bringing understanding of dental disease to schools. Uh, she did this a few years ago. And uh, in her first year, she collected some pretty important data. The percentage of children with decay through motivational interviewing, through her community outreach and activities with the families resulted in an almost 40% decrease in untreated decay. This is really important. When you show numbers like this, people want to support your project. People want to support what you're doing and it awakens more interest in oral health. We've got other grant projects that are, that are currently going. Uh, Eastern Carolina University Dental School has a three-year grant, Jacoby Health Systems. Uh, we are finding that this was the year where hospitals uh, were uh, awakened to the possibility of having a CDHC within their hospital dental setting. Uh, we saw a job ad earlier in the year from a Washington DC hospital, which specifically asked for a CDHC trained individual. These individuals are not doing clinical duties. Uh, they are doing case management and getting patients into care. Post-graduation, uh, what are the opportunities? We advise people to start uh, small, two to four hours a week in a primary care office. Why is this important? Because only about 60 to 62% of individuals with commercial dental insurance utilize it. So underserved isn't just a term that applies to uh, Medicaid, socially disadvantaged, uh, compromised individuals. It can also apply to those that have the means to have oral health services, but don't know where, don't know how, don't know how to connect. Uh, and so the opportunity there is extremely important. Data collection is an extremely important part of this. The participants learn how to collect data for the purposes of grant writing. And what better opportunity for advocacy uh, on a variety of fronts than to learn how to collect data and share that data. I'm gonna share a job opportunity here from uh, a Florida newspaper for a oral health navigator. Uh, you'll see that there are no clinical duties in this job description. It is about scheduling, uh, outreach, in-home education. Uh, these are uh, services that somebody could do but wouldn't be easy if you didn't have CPHC training. There's another job description for a preventive coordinator. This one is from a Michigan newspaper. Uh, this is about an individual who will uh, be present uh, with the patient during the treatment, uh, be present for home care instructions, and then follow up at the group home. This allows for coordination of the needs of the patient. Care coordination is still a new concept in the dental world. Uh, we still like to hand people a sheet of paper and give them a number to call, but that doesn't explain the questions that they may have on an ongoing basis and doesn't give them the emotional support uh, that is so critical to having patients enter care and stay into care. But more importantly, for young moms to have them be confident navigators themselves of the family health care system, particularly regarding uh, oral health. This is a job posting in Tennessee. Uh, we had a health center dental director hire four of these individuals with training. Here is an official job description from New York, from a health center in New York. Uh, we're delighted that uh, this full-time CDHC happens to be a hygienist who is working full-time, full-time as a navigator coordinator between the health center and between the hospital emergency department. Here is the DC hospital job description. Uh, they're based in the uh, community health center uh, and they over, they are over, their job description is to include working directly with populations who are at risk for dental disease and unsure of how to access a dental program. Many of us have heard uh, Rural Admiral Tim Ricks 
uh, talk about the millions of people that see a physician that don't see a dentist and the ones that see a dentist that don't see a physician. Here's putting the trained individual right into that medical dental vortex, uh, a position in a hospital. Additional details uh, from the DC hospital, and that is because we get so many questions on, well, what do they do after they graduate? Um, and some of them still maintain uh, a hygiene or a dental assisting role in addition to doing some outreach, or some of them get to transition full-time into opportunities like this one. A Vermont opportunity here was for a, a program coordinator, a grant coordinator, and this position uh, would oversee activities for school-based dental health, oral health surveillance. Again, an emphasis on data because data always tells our story, doesn't it? And this position also collaborates with other programs and external partners. Again, someone with that dental knowledge base can really streamline and efficiently communicate what's needed for any group of patients. In Colorado, kids in need of dentistry, and many of you uh, may know uh, the pediatrician uh, from Colorado who is Patty Braun. Uh, Dr. Braun is a very prominent member of the American Academy of Pediatrics. She has a CDHC trained hygienist in her office who bridges the gap between a dental clinic and being in her practice. And the opportunity for the kids in need of dentistry, they have two or three additional people that have gone through the training, collecting data. And in fact, they moved into a new building so they could be closer to primary care settings. This is a Las Vegas example of before and after a community dental health coordinator train, person was trained. And uh, look at the difference in the opportunities realized before and after training. Now they have a large school-based program. They also have a full-time data collection manager. And this is what she noticed. Uh, the sealant percentage increased. Uh, no obvious dental problems increased. However, to us, the most important bullet point is the number of patients that followed up uh, because they had this guided referral system, because they had a dental professional walking with them. Uh, this is important information. Again, uh, when you can provide data like this, uh, there are people that rise up and want to help you. The philanthropic women of Nevada uh, bestowed upon Future Smiles a $470,000 grant uh, to build a building, hire a dentist, and complete these treatment plans. So what else is new? Uh, program at an FQHC, and that would be Zoo Fall. Uh, HRSA grants. I also want to add that we have a dental school which has launched the CDHC program within their in-house dental hygiene program. And we have a major federal agency that will be making an announcement before the end of the year that they will be utilizing the CDHC curriculum for their almost 3,000 uh, dental professionals that work within their program. And what do we offer as support for this? Ongoing technical assistance, student recruitment, we do informational webinars. We also work so that the state association knows how many grads are in their state. They utilize this from a legislative standpoint. And in the words of a graduate, uh, pairing oral health with community health worker expertise, uh, interviewing skills, advocacy, experience, more experience into enrolling patients into third-party payers, going to patients where they're at, it gave me a broader perspective when I had to fill out a Medicaid application, and that is part of an assignment of this program. I became more empathetic and started helping patients fill out their health histories when I saw them struggling. How many uh, people have that increased sensitization for that barrier of underserved populations? So the opportunities are a lot. I've shared a lot of information with you. I'm happy to answer any questions now. I'd like to turn it over. I'll stop sharing. I'll turn it over to Dr. Souter, my good friend, um, who's a genius, quite frankly. Thank you. Great. Well, um, again, my name is Nathan Souter, general dentist. Um, here to talk about teledentistry and how it can be helpful um, both now and in the future, what tools we might have available um, by learning how to use teledentistry and, you know, reiterating that process as we 
figure out ways that can help us reach people. So um, <clears throat> I like to call it teledentistry and the digitization of patient care because um, a lot of components of teledentistry are just digital ways of doing what we already do um, in dentistry. Um, I'm a practice owner. I have a, a small private practice, me, myself and another doctor. Um, also do, do consulting on the side to help uh, mostly health centers and nonprofits uh, learn how to, to implement teledentistry. I'm also um, a board member and a practice owner for a, a DSO that does portable dentistry to geriatric patients and uh, IDD patients. I'm on, on the board. I'm not, no longer the board chair. I finished two terms as the board chair of the Missouri Coalition for Oral Health. Um, and uh, mo more newly, I'm a co-founder for a software platform that helps assist in organizing and care coordinating patient care um, in dental practice settings. But my roots come from public health. So uh, I, I graduated dental school and started at a FQHC, just like Jane used to work at a FQHC. Uh, and it, when I started, it was just myself. Uh, there was no dental program. And so from there, I helped the, the pro, the, the build the dental department. And when I left, <clears throat> the year I left in 2018, after five years of being the dental director and then staying on to help them with the administrative stuff uh, part-time, we were seeing 9,500 unique patients and about 20, for about 22,000 visits um, across multiple programs. We had fixed clinics, in, embedded school-based clinics. We had um, a mobile unit that went to, uh, was an ER diversion in our, come up some of our communities that had high ER numbers, um, as well as the thing I'm most passionate about is our teledentistry program. So we had the three portable vehicles that would go out, portable equipment and teams that would go to schools, nursing homes, and our primary care offices to support and find new ways to bring patients into the health center. Um, and that's where I grew this passion to teach people about teledentistry. And, and, and from leaving the health center, uh, I've been able, been fortunate enough to, uh, to teach people work for state governments like the Missouri Department of Health, where I teach other dentists through a HRSA grant how to do teledentistry in Missouri. But a little bit about what teledentistry is, and I saw a commercial, you know, between sessions that was um, pretty neat. Um, but the main thing to remember about teledentistry is that it's the same standard of care, uh, no matter you're in person or or you're, or you're doing telehealth. And I like it, it, in telehealth, the umbrella of telehealth, where teledentistry is a component of it, um, legislatively usually and through uh, rulemaking. Um, we kind of group it into two buckets, but under each bucket is uh, is some some sub uh, categorization. So, when most people start with telehealth, they think of synchronous synchronous visits. Okay, stuff like Zoom, where you're talking directly to people, and so um, those would be um, live visits through uh, a communication channel through Zoom. It also in in the broader telehealth scheme of things, there's there's team care where, where a team of providers comes together and talks about a patient um, virtually um, and helps assist in that patient's care. And in medicine, they're compensated for some of that type of work. Um, in dentistry, not so much yet, but I like to include that in there to give people the perspective. And so um, in Missouri, we have something called an echo where we, uh, we can present cases and learn from each other. That's a form of telehealth. Um, and then lastly, there's mobile health or M health, and that's kind of an evolving thing. It's like I got a loose definition that, that seems to evolve a lot, but um, that, that ranges from you being able to get some advice through your mobile phone directly, and maybe not with the provider that you're going to see. Um, it also includes things like educational games through, through applications, you know, to educate and, and gamify the uh, oral health education. So. Um, a little bit of this might sound a little far-fetched, but um, uh, bear with me as I kind of dive deeper and give you some examples here. The next big category is asynchronous. And so there's two kind of subcategories of uh, asynchronous. Asynchronous, also known as store and forward. Uh, on the right-hand side, you see I have a little uh, medallion or, or a thing because the gold standard of teledentistry really is store and forward 
asynchronous visits between one professional and another professional, okay? And it usually is a dental hygienist to a dentist. In some cases, it can be a dental assistant in some states to a dentist um, or uh, a dentist to a specialist. Um, and so those are kind of the main ways that you can really gain efficiency because not a lot of things can, you don't get a whole lot of added benefit from having a synchronous visit because the added benefit uh, is that is really that you don't have to synchronize the patient with the dentist. And that's where that uh, synchronizing their geography or even their schedule between the patient and the dentist is the limiting factor to accessing care. And so what, what asynchronous teledentistry allows you to do is a professional sees a patient, gathers good quality diagnostic data, saves it for later review by the dentist. And so that's, that's a, what I'm gonna call the gold standard. Um, um, and then also in the future, we're starting to get glimpses of things. And so a lot of people wear Apple watches. I, I don't have one, um, but one day I'll be cool enough to get one, but Apple watches, Fitbits, um, things like that those are connected devices and um, they're becoming an important part of our lives. And in hospital care, a big push for telehealth that has saved the, uh, a lot of patient time and money is, is patient monitoring by when you get dis discharging a patient sooner and just monitoring in the comfort of their own home is a good way to save money, especially around chronic disease and recovery, okay? Um, and also about changing behaviors and helping coach a person into better health. And so I have an image here of a connected toothbrush, which there are such things, but how they work with the provider being involved is very limited right now, but I think there are possibilities and I've got some more to show you on different things that are getting developed that can add benefit in the future. <clears throat> so when I talk about teledentistry, I kind of give the, I break them down in like some applications so that people can kind of wrap their head around ways it's used, all right? And so I've grouped it into eight, eight different applications. Um, and these applications can be synchronous or asynchronous. Um, and they're kind of like case examples of how you can, can do it, all right? And when the pandemic struck, most people who had ignored teledentistry or just by circumstance avoided any contact with it, um, uh, were aware of it because they needed to do something to connect to their patients. And so most people, the majority of the dental industry came to teledentistry during the pandemic um, and was like, oh, I got to triage my patients at least and be in contact with them. And so that's people's introduction and they think about a Zoom call first. And that's where it started. And that's probably where most people stopped using it, okay? But what I have seen is that there's more applications to that. Um, and I'm gonna get into that, including hygiene assessments, covering satellite offices, doing follow-ups and consults, specialty consultations, using outreach, medical dental integration, and, and so forth. And during the pandemic, um, the ADA, um, the Health Policy Institute, which is a great resource, um, published some data when they were surveying. So they started asking dentists, are you doing virtual consultations uh, tri triage with your patients? So they asked a very specific application from that list there. They asked, are you triaging your patients with teledentistry? And in public health, it was um, more than half. In private practice, it was around, it, it, the limited triage peaked at about 24, 25% and then dropped down to 12%, okay? But me being the person who was doing a lot of these presentations and hearing from lots of dentists who are emailing me and calling me and all sorts of stuff and asking questions at webinars, I knew more than that was going on then. And so for months and months and months, I begged them, can you ask a broader question about teledentistry and how they might be using technology? And so finally, thankfully they did. And so when we did that, we actually found out that in public health, over 60% of people were using some form of teledentistry. Um, and there was broad ways that they were utilizing it. And in private practice, almost 40% of dentists were using some form of teledentistry at that point, okay? Which is way bigger than 12%, which is what they were telling people. Um, and that's what I was seeing, was that there really was more usage going on, whether people were doing post-ops or patient education or orthodontic checkups, something like that. 
So I'm just going to give you some examples on limited evaluation and triage and where that falls, but it also overlaps with follow-ups and consultations. So here you have uh, two ways you, you can limit do a limited evaluation or post-op. So a lot of people, you can collect data and ask your patients to send you pictures as well as um, answer a very specific set of questions. And I recommend at any point in time, you're gonna do ask questions, have logic-based forms that dive deeper whenever certain questions are answered. If you answer this, then skip this or ask this then um, to, to, to dig deeper because you're not there to answer the questions. Um, and so you can receive that information as a check-in or as an introduction to a patient to review it and triage them. You can also do a Zoom call if you'd like or have an assigned staff member do a Zoom call and then they pull you over um, you know, between operatories to come check on a patient if you needed to. And so what I found is uh, that um, post-ops and consults were getting used a lot as people were going back into practice because they were limiting unnecessary reasons people need to come in. And they found out that once they learned how to triage people with Zoom calls and data capture, they were more comfortable to then say, hey, you know what? When you have that clear liner and you were gonna come in, I'm just gonna zoom in and see how those are fitting with you. Or after this extraction, I'm going to schedule a time and we'll zoom and we'll check on you, see how you're doing there. Um, but also case presentation. Some people get overwhelmed and they wanna come in and talk to you about their options again. You can have that put up in a PowerPoint and then Zoom with them and have your treatment coordinator go over it or your office manager go over it with the patient. And then you could step in and answer any detailed questions that need answered. Um, the next big one, the one I'm, I'm really passionate about is um, partnering with your hygienist and working as a very cohesive team to send them out into the community to reach new populations that are having barriers getting into the office, okay? And that's where our pilot program in Missouri started and where I started teaching people how to replicate that process, okay? And so on, in our first year of our pilot program, we served over 1,200 patients this way by using portable equipment and going out. We trained all of our dentists and hygienists to do this. Um, we would take portable equipment like you can see there, and we would go in there and there's me almost 10 years ago. So that's getting, a, needs a little updating. Um, and then <clears throat> what you got here is um, an example of the data set required to perform an exam. So on an adult, um, this adult patient, you've got their full mouth x-rays, you've got a orthodontic series of photographs, which is uh, one thing I kind of recommend is, is uh, if people think about intraoral photos, and unless you have a, a system that lets you template your photos, they can be really discombobulating and you can, as a provider who's gonna review it and do a treatment plan, you can get lost in a sea of intraoral photos because you don't can't tell if this is three or 14, okay? But uh, if you have an orthodontic series of photos, you can get 99% of the way there with the x-rays and an orthodontic series of photos. And then we just take intraoral photos of the, teeth with issues or suspicious lesions. And then you would have, I like to leverage the odontogram. So the hygienist could mark on the odontogram suspicious lesions, and it gives me a visual cue to then jump in and look at the pictures and x-rays. Finally, a perio chart for your adult patients so that you can evaluate the um, you know, probability of a, 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 of a tooth, you know, the prognosis of being good or fair, whether it's mobile or not, and prescribing a, you know, appropriate uh, periodontal therapy. And then finally, uh, I can't talk more uh, enough about logic-based notes. So if you have a system that lets you do logic-based notes, you could get more of what you need every time predictively. So my hygienist has a logic-based note that when a certain question is answered, it requires the next answer to be answered so that I know that when a tooth is symptomatic, I want to know, okay, is it cold sensitive? Yes or no. Okay. Is it mobile? Yes or no. I want to know those questions. And sometimes when you're, when you're in a mobile setting, that hygienist and that assistant are out there in the field, they're doing so many things and it, it's easy for things to slip through the cracks. And so if you prompt those responses, you can get the data you need that, to make a decision. Um, in my office, um, now that I'm in private practice, I've been able to test a lot of things. And so 
we have lots of different cameras I've tested, I've tried, um, learned ones that work, ones that need, need improvement and things like that. So you can get like ones like lens, lens rings that attach to a mobile device. You can, um, this one in the center is like the most cost efficient way to do it. A snap and shot camera that um, I recommend. There's a, a like a vendor that sells this and they calibrate it for dentistry that so that it doesn't auto focus. You can't just pick any digital camera off the shelf. It won't work for you. Um, and then in that mouthwatch camera is great. Um, but now we've we've moved to a very expensive tool, but this 3D scan that I'll get into. Um, so um, one example of outreach that we do at my practice. Um, is we do uh, free mouth guards for the football team. Um, and so we started that this year. And so we, the hygienist goes and she does teledentistry intraoral scan, which captures photographs you'll see in a second. Um, simultaneous of the scan, it does a 3D impression and does the pictures. Um, we have a 3D printer at my office. So we make the models and we do suck down mouth guards for the whole football team. Um, and that's just an outreach program that we do. Um, in my practice, we do the 3D scan, we take x-rays, we chart in the chart, um, and then we use Helier that I created to organize the tasks for follow-up and the care coordination. And uh, the reason we do, we've done that, we've, re, we've uh, constantly trying to optimize the process and evaluate the process. So when most people start to do teledentistry, um, they'll have like a virtual column in the in the dental chair or dental dental um, screen here, and then um, when the hygienist would have saw people the day before, those visits that then need the doctor to review them the next day are just like parked in the schedule. But if you think about it, when you're doing asynchronous, you don't need a schedule because schedules built for simultaneously seeing your patients in person, and so you're really hacking a schedule to accomplish this, and that's what most health centers do. Uh, and, and at private practices is they, they hack the schedule because that's the tool you have at your disposal. I wrote a paper on how we, uh, in the Journal of Public Health Dentistry, where we talked about how we came back from the pandemic and managed virtual visits and in-person visits um, using task management protocols so that we can um, use, uh, keep track of our patients and figure out who needs to see, who needs to be, who was seen for an assessment who needs a teledentistry exam, who needs a referral, who needs to be seen for follow-up care. Um, some case examples. Um, this is how we're using the scanner. Um, is uh, It takes this digital mount of the, picture of the patient's mouth, but it also, in the same exact scan, in one scan that takes eight minutes, or five minutes sometimes, usually, you get intraoral photographs and near-infrared photographs. And so you could see here, on a patient that wasn't due for x-rays, it caught an interproximal lesion um, in the near infrared photograph um, so that we were able to verify that with this bite wing on the right. And you could see that mesial um, carries that, that was there. And so really cool tools um, to really up our game in teledentistry. Here's some examples on how it can help with case presentation and education. So. Um, I told you as part of that nursing home program that we run um, uh, with Enable, they <clears throat> use um, the iTero scanner, and then they send this with the treatment plan to communicate that, hey, this too, this is the doctor's handwriting here, missing crown, you know, and there's decay uh, on this other tooth and a missing crown. So really clear way to educate the parent, parent or guardian or, or the patient. Um, here's some other screenshots of how the scanner um, allows you to see how it's taking um, a 3D model that you are able to tour the mouth with your with your fingertips, you know, and go through the mouth um, in great detail. Um, and you're able to then draw on it and make recommendations for, for, the, for, for the patient. So last thing I'm going to get on is just like where this is going. Um, uh, I believe that the future is in the cloud. And so this is an article from Dental Economics. Getting away from a server-based system is the future because of the way that it frees up the technology and makes it easier for you to have connected systems and to be able to access the data at any time in any place. And so moving to a cloud-based system um, is a strong recommendation of mine. 
<clears throat> um, and there's a lot of uh, new ones coming out that you can evaluate. Um, also automation. So a lot of newer systems allow you to, I'm a data nerd and I think it's critical that you have structured data and you automate as much as possible. And so you can require things when you have newer newer systems. You can make if and and statements so that you always get the data that you need appropriately. Um, and also skip things that aren't necessary. You know, instead of like a giant text box that needs everything filled in, you know, it's a little more uh, intuitive. Next, the future is leading us to this. This isn't here yet. I mean, I've seen it demoed, but I have not experienced it in firsthand is AI. And so there will come a time in the future where AI assists us in charting. And so things that like read your x-ray, like you take, your hygienist takes the x-ray, it reads the x-ray in a way, it offers suggestions like, it appears that tooth number 13 and tooth number nine are missing. And then it automatic, you can confirm that and then it auto charts all that stuff for you. So there's less manual clicking going on. Um, or, hey, I, there's, there's new, so I think I'm gonna get to it in a minute. I might have a slide in a little bit. Uh, I'm almost done. That, that shows the AI interpreting uh, a first opinion on a radiograph and suggesting, hey, there's a 80% chance that there's a PA, le there's a lesion at the root of this too. Um, also, medical integration, ways that we can cross-link our data so that we can get relevant, relevant information directly from the source um, so that we don't have to require the patient to remember that stuff. Um, patient monitoring, it is, I'm gonna give you three examples of this. This company here, Dental Monitoring, uh, you, this is for monitoring your clear aligners and they're gonna move probably to doing other stuff too, like um, just giving you suggestions. But um, this company is a French company and it is so successful. And, and, but if you don't do orthodontics, you don't know about it. Um, but this type of thing, uh, patients are using this all over the place in orthodontists. Like the orthodontists are including this in their in their Invisaligns essentially now, so that people don't have to come in anymore for their checks. Um, smart toothbrushes, I already talked about that, but da data where that you can get from the hygienists to say, or their hygiene hygiene department can get this information and help coach a patient that's struggling, and so that you can kind of help identify ways to intervene. Good way for our care coordinator to get involved, probably. Um, next is like pH monitoring. Like there are literally people building things that you get a high risk patient. You're trying to figure out why are they high risk? Is it diet? You want to real get a real good way to do it. You you can educate them in real time on their own habits and how it's affecting their pH. That would be amazing when it can happen and it's affordable. But people are working on these really cool technologies. Um, other ways, oh, um, everyone's familiar with like in um, 23andMe and Ancestry.com, those kind of spit tests for genetics. This is a spit test that um, just went live recently um, where um, you, you spit in it and send it in and it gives you a complete library of the bacteria that's in your mouth and whether or not, how much of it's in there, the concentration of it, and whether or not um, it's contributing to your periodontal disease or your carry, you know, carries risk. It gives you a carries risk score and a periodontal risk score. And so being able to give this type of tool to, to help educate patients um, and make decisions and see if you're, you're making a change over time is gonna be critical. Um, lastly, it's about risk gratification. So what teledentistry and all this technology is gonna let us get is this future state. Um, where certain patients that are low risk need less attention and high risk patients deserve more attention. But we gotta get the right tools in place so that we can achieve this vision. And so right now in this current model that we call the roller skate, the dentist has to touch every patient that comes in every hour. So this is patient getting touched by the dentist. The last thing I was just gonna say was that with teledentistry, only the high risk people need to be seen every visit that they have. Um, and so this frees up the dentist to focus on the high risk in the treatment. And when you add those patient monitoring tools, you can even monitor more people. The dentist is able to help more people get to health 
than they were when they were constrained by having to touch every single patient. So that was it. <laughs>